But we begin in Brazil, where the current election process has held out the possibility of a candidate, Jair Bolsonaro, being voted in as president, even though, or perhaps because, he has professed himself an admirer of the military dictatorship, which ran from 1964 to 1985. There are five candidates in total, and a second round runoff vote between the two who come out on top on Sunday is likely to be required. But whoever wins, the campaigning has harked back to the old days of that dictatorship. So we're looking at one of the key events from that period. In October 1968, a violent street battle erupted between students from the left and the right in the centre of Sao Paulo. It became a symbol of political and social tension in Brazil. Thomas Papel has been talking to two former students who were there. In 1968, Paulo de Tarso Venceslau was a student at the University of São Paulo. They were ready for the attack. They had acid bombs, Molotov cocktails and even guns. Marcel Mendes was a student at Mackenzie University. I saw people injured by stones, beaten with sticks. I saw people bleeding. Mackenzie Presbyterian University, a traditional private institution founded in the 19th century, took up a whole block on one side of Rua Maria Antonia in the center of São Paulo. On the other side of the street was the philosophy faculty of the University of São Paulo, or USP. It was the biggest and most important public higher education institution in Brazil. Maria Antonia was the center there were lots of universities in the area, and Maria Antoni Street was like a magnet for all those students, because of the lively bars where they drank and played music. The Brazilian singer and composer Chico Buarque, who studied at the architecture faculty around the corner, used to play for us there. So there was a strong cultural appeal. At a time of political struggle against a military dictatorship, Maria Antônia was a hub for political activity. Culture and politics always walked together in Brazil. As in many parts of the world, 1968 had been a year of protests in Brazil. The killing of a student in March by the police in Rio had triggered demonstrations in various cities, all violently repressed by security forces. In June, a hundred thousand people took to the streets of Rio in a march against the government. After four years of military rule, Brazilians wanted change. We wanted freedom, political freedom. People were also very unhappy with the economic situation, with the decrease in wages. And the students were promoting new values, changes in social customs, mini skirts, drugs, music. All those influences came from outside, from Paris, the Latin Quarter. By that time, the philosophy faculty was also attracting younger high school students who liked to hang around and take part in political activities, like collecting money to organize a national student congress scheduled for October. And it was at the beginning of October that the hostilities with students from Mackenzie University started. Lots of students at Mackenzie sympathized with the military regime. Marcel Mendes was an engineering student there. It started at a crossroads, where many USP students were asking for money from people in cars at traffic lights. Students from Mackenzie watched them, and at some point, eggs started flying towards the students asking for money. Slaps and blows were exchanged. There was some physical aggression, but nothing very serious, but it escalated later. I was standing at the entrance to Mackenzie's engineering school. What I saw looked like a fight between hooligans. Groups fighting each other, throwing stones, beating each other with sticks. Students from Mackenzie were trying to invade the philosophy building and vice versa. The groups kept on fighting on the street throughout the afternoon of October the 2nd. But things got much worse the next day, a Thursday. The day started very tense, but now they were exchanging not only sticks and stones, but also Molotov cocktails and rockets. They were making them in Mackenzie's chemistry laboratories. Things like gunpowder rockets with gasoline. When you fire them, they explode. 
and bombs they made him during the night. I saw a freshman from Mackenzie throwing a metal cylinder used as a concrete mold to the other side of the street without looking. If that had hit someone, it would have killed him. They were throwing whatever came to hand, doors, desks, pieces of wood. Some of them climbed to the top of a building which was under construction and belonged to Mackenzie, and they started throwing building materials, even sinks and toilets. They just threw them onto the crowds on the street below. At this point in the battle, a group of high school students who were on the ground decided to invade the building under construction. That's when one of the Mackenzie students shot at and killed one of the students. José Guimarães, a 20-year-old high school student, was shot in the head and died on the way to hospital. At the time, his death was not investigated. In 2015, a Truth Commission, which examined crimes committed by the military dictatorship, concluded that he was killed by Osni Ricardo, a police informer and member of an anti-communist paramilitary group called CCC, Communist Hunting Commando. It isn't clear if Osni was actually a student at Mackenzie, but it is clear that the university was infiltrated by members of the paramilitary group and by the police. I remember one of them, who always walked around wearing a dark cloak. He always had a gun with him. We knew he was an agent. But there could have been other members of the CCC amongst the students and maybe the teachers. At the end of the morning of the 3rd of October, the news about José Guimarães' death had spread among the students, changing the dynamic of the conflict. Marcel Mendes tells what happened next. The blooded shirt of Guimarães motivated a huge march through the center of São Paulo. Thousands of students took part in the protest. They claimed that Guimarães was killed by Mackenzie students and clashed with the police. They overturned cars, set them on fire. By the time the students left for that march through the city center, the police had already taken up position around Mackenzie University. The state forces were mobilized to defend a private institution instead of defending a public institution, the philosophy faculty. At the end of the afternoon, on the second day, Rua Maria Antonia was empty. The next day, the road had been closed by the police. That's when the invasion happened. A group with many armed people, who I believe were from the CCC, invaded the philosophy faculty and basically destroyed everything. They burned documents, archives, vandalized the whole building. Two weeks later, more than a thousand students were arrested for taking part in a clandestine National Congress. And two months later, the military government brought in a new law. It was called Institutional Act 5, and it would become infamous. It gave the military power to intervene in all levels of government, to censor whatever they wanted and to suspend individual rights. The law effectively institutionalized torture and censorship. And for many students identified with left-wing movements like Paulo de Tarso Venceslau, these events drove them to extreme measures in the fight against the military regime. They joined armed guerrilla groups. Many went to jail, were tortured, exiled or killed. Thomas Papon was talking to Paulo de Tarso Venceslao and Marcel Mendes. So, what exactly was the Battle of Maria Antonia? Joining me now is Dr Fiona McCauley, an expert in the history of Brazil at the University of Bradford. Now, we heard there how the battle led to a more hardline phase of the Brazilian dictatorship. But first, what was that dictatorship like and how did it differ from others in the region? Well, it's a very interesting question, the word dictatorship, because at the moment that very word is being questioned and has been, in fact, ever since 1964. Those who conducted the military coup did so with a significant parcel of support from the civilian population. So many of the supporters of what that military coup represented and represents will say, well, actually, it was a civilian military government. They don't call it a coup. They don't call it a military regime. They call it a counter-revolution. And in that sense, it was quite similar to others in the region, in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Chile, 
because they saw this as a counter-revolution against communism, against subversion. So they saw themselves as holding the line of Western, Christian, anti-communist values. So that they have in common. But perhaps what's slightly different in the Brazilian case is that they very clearly had civilian support. And this was demonstrated because for 20 years they actually maintained a two-party electoral system underneath these dictatorial conditions. So they had the facade of democracy, even within a very oppressive and repressive environment. Uh, And is it clear when it comes to something like that episode, the, the street battle in 1968, that the military, in effect, provoked what happened in order to justify a further crackdown on civil liberties? Yes, I think that's a fair interpretation of events because the bogeyman of communism always has to be invoked in order to justify the draconian response. Actually, there were not very many active communists in Brazil. In fact, there weren't very many active communists across Latin America. What you had was fairly nationalist, mildly socialist movements who were then mischaracterized as kind of Cuban proxies and communists. And at the moment, the bogeyman is Venezuela. So the current political climate is one of fear that somehow Brazil will turn into Venezuela and a kind of communist chaos. So it's always quite useful to have moments and incidents that heighten fear and anxiety and put violence on the streets because, of course, ordinary people are frightened of violence and chaos. And so they will tend to support politically forces that will promise to eliminate that and bring about social order. So is that why we have a candidate now in Mr Bolsonaro who almost champions that dictatorship? Why, why is, this, is there a nostalgia for those times which were you know, quite harsh in many respects? There is a nostalgia, and the nostalgia is one for political order. It's not really an economic nostalgia because, you know, the military regime had its ups and downs economically. It did very well for the first half, and then it began to decline. But what we have at the moment in Brazil is extreme economic anxiety. You've got unemployment, dropping wages. You've got a public security crisis, a law and order crisis. In Brazil, something like 63,000 people a year are murdered. And all of those anxieties together form this kind of climate of fear and a desire for easy solutions and for a strongman politics. I don't even think it's sort of nostalgia for the military regime, because to be perfectly honest, if you ask people what happened during that 20 year period, they would be very vague. What they have in their minds is an idea that there was order and that somebody was in charge. And on that, they build their nostalgia and their hopes that somehow Mr. Bolsonaro will resolve all of those problems. Going back there over the last three uh, decades or so, how would you characterise the way in which Brazil has dealt with the legacy of dictatorship? It really hasn't dealt with it. The first difference from other countries in the region is that they brought in an amnesty law, which other countries did, but it's a very different amnesty law because it was asked for by the people on the left who had lost their political rights under the military regime. So in order for that law to pass, the military said, well, fine, you can have your political rights back, but we want exemption from prosecution as a counterpart. That law has never been overturned. There was finally a truth commission that investigated who had been killed and disappeared and who was responsible, but it never got to the point of criminal prosecution. And so effectively, the military and police forces who were involved from the 1960s onwards in this kind of repression, they've never been brought to account. Nobody's been prosecuted. Nobody's lost their jobs. There was no kind of purge within police ranks. So the culture of the use of torture and extrajudicial killings has simply continued from the 1960s and 70s onwards to the current day. Dr Fiona McCauley from the University of Bradford. Many thanks.